All right, we are ready to start here, and uh, some of our other colleagues will be joining us. We'll see how far we can get in this process. Uh, as you all know, there is a change in the schedule today um, for truly unusual circumstances. So we will be interrupting as time goes on for votes repeatedly. We apologize for that. What we'll do is simply go over. It will be one vote at a time so we can run over, come back, probably no more than a 10, 15 minute interruption as we go with that. So with that, I'm going to call this hearing to order. I note the chair, quorum, uh, presence of a quorum, which is a pretty low bar for us here today. Subcommittees on National Security, Homeland Defense, Foreign Operations, and the Subcommittees on National Parks, Forests, and Public Lands are meeting today to hear testimony on how environmental laws and regulations impede border security operations and even harm the borderland environment. So under the rules, the opening statements will be limited, limited to the chairman and the ranking members whenever they show up. Um, and so that we can hear from our witnesses more quickly. However, I will ask unanimous consent to include any other member's opening statement of the record if submitted to the clerk by the close of business days. Hearing no objection, that will be so ordered. I also ask unanimous consent of the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Reyes, who has asked if he could make a statement in the hearing, be allowed to be our first witness of the day if he is here when we reach that time. Otherwise, when he gets here, we will interrupt to allow that to take place. If no objection, that's ordered. I just banged the gavel. I also ask unanimous consent that the gentleman from New Mexico, Mr. Pierce, when he arrives, be allowed to join us on the dais and, and introduce one of the witnesses and participate in this hearing. Once again, without objection, so ordered. And I will make uh, my opening statement after my colleagues have had a chance to speak, so I will now recognize the chairman of the Subcommittee on National Security, Homeland Defense, and Foreign Operations for his opening statement. Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, thank you uh, to my colleague and, and friend and, uh, and chairman, uh, Mr. Bishop. Uh, today we are examining the extent to which federal environmental laws and regulations affect the ability of law enforcement to patrol and secure our borders. We are also examining the extent to which restrictions placed upon border patrol agents are actually harming the environment. Since December of 2006, the drug cartel related violence in Mexico has continued to escalate in both frequency and intensity. In Mexico, almost 3,000 people were killed in 2007. That number increased to almost 7,000 in the year 2008, more than 9,500 people killed in 2009, and by 2010 that number is now over 15,000. According to reports, most of these crimes occurred in or within a short distance of the United States border towns and Americans have also suffered. Three U.S. law enforcement officers have been injured or lost their lives in recent months. On February 15, 2011, two U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement agents, uh, Zapata and Avila, were both shot in the line of duty. Mr. Zapata later died from his injuries. In December 2010, U.S. Border Patrol agent Brian Terry was fatally shot near Tucson, Arizona, while attempting to prevent criminal activity along the border. Now, at this point, this, I was going to show you some of the brutal photos, having reviewed those photos. Um, they are so graphic and so disturbing, I, I, um, I worry about sharing them in this, in this format here. This steep and continual increase of violence just across our southwest border raises serious concerns for the public and members on both sides of the aisle. The Department of the Homeland Security is responsible for securing the U.S. border. It is responsible it, in response to illegal activity at the southwest border, including illegal activities occurring on Federal lands, the Department of Homeland Security has in the last few years increased the amount of agents and resources directed towards preventing human smuggling, drug trafficking, kidnapping, and illegal immigration. Despite the increase of Federal resources, Richard Stana, Director of Homeland Security Issues at the GAO, the Government of Accountability Office, has identified gaping holes in our border secure strategy. Just recently, Mr. Stana testified that there are only 129 miles of the roughly 1,954-mile-long 1, southwest border where the Border Patrol can actually, quote, deter or detect and apprehend illegal entries, end quote. So let me repeat, only 129 of the nearly 2,000 miles are adequately secured. This is unacceptable and the Federal Government should be ashamed. With the Federal Government spending billions of dollars on flawed border security strategy, we must find a better solution that is comprehensive, intelligent, and cost effective. Because of the Department of Homeland Security's inability to secure much of the border, our national security depends on Border Patrol's access to Federal lands. In 2006, the Department of Homeland Security, Department of Interior, and the Department of Agriculture all entered into a memorandum of understanding. 
The purpose of this MOU was to guide and facilitate Border Patrol activities on Federal lands. It also sought to ensure the concerns about protecting the environment would be addressed. The MOU emphasized the need for cooperation and timely responses by Federal land managers to requests by the Border Patrol. According to the MOU, the parties agreed to cooperate and do so, quote, in an expedited manner, end quote. However, a recent GAO report authored by Ms. Middle indicated that, quote, cooperation has not always occurred, end quote, between Department of Homeland Security, Interior, and the USDA. They will be testifying today all on the same panel. Border Patrol agents in charge of the 16 of the 26 stations have told the GAO that, quote, when they attempt to obtain a permit or permission to access portions of Federal land, delays restrictions have resulted from com complying with land management laws, end quote. I fully support the utmost protection of our environment and multiple uses of public lands, but at the same time, we must listen to the Border Patrol agents who put their lives on the line every day. Some agents have asserted that delays resulting from environmental laws have, according to Ms. Middle's report, quote, lessened agents' ability to detect undocumented aliens, end quote. Again, this is totally unacceptable. An unsecured border is a national security threat. The sooner this administration realizes this fact and acts accordingly, the safer we will all be. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses. I appreciate all of you, the time and effort. Uh, many of you have traveled from great distances. We appreciate you being here today. Yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Representative Grijalva, who is the ranking member on my subcommittee, I see on the floor, so I know he is here with us in spirit, and as soon as he arrives, we will be recognized to give any opening statement he would wish to do that. We do have the ranking member from Government Ops, uh, whatever your title is now, here, <laughs> and I appreciate Mr. Tierney for joining us, and I will recognize him for as much time as he wishes to make an yeah. opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank all of our witnesses that will be testifying today. The question posed by today's hearing is whether environmental laws prevent the Border Patrol from safely securing our border. The unanimous answer in written testimony from the Border Patrol, the Department of the Interior, the Department of Agriculture, and the General Accountability Office appears to be no. As Chief Itiello made clear in his testimony, border security and environmental stewardship are not mutually exclusive. Let's not make an attempt to create a false choice where none exists. Of course, the Wilderness Act and other environmental laws place some restrictions on the Border Patrol's operations in sensitive areas. But according to the bulk of testimony that we will receive today, those restrictions impose a relatively low burden that has been successfully managed through interagency cooperation. Mr. Chairman, this isn't to say that there are not serious incursions on our border. We know, for example, that drug smugglers and human traffickers continue to use Federal lands to perpetrate their Ill illegal activities. Nonetheless, while some of these lands are used to commit illicit activity, many are also home to precious environmental resources, cultural heritage sites, and endangered species. The message from today's hearing is that the Border Patrol believes that it can effectively achieve its border security mission and be a responsible steward of the environment at the same time. The Department of the Interior and the Department of Agriculture agree, and the General Accountability Office, which has studied this issue extensively, concurs. This committee is no stranger to the challenges posed by securing the southern border and the ongoing violence in Mexico. In the last Congress, for example, the committee held several hearings examining the security threats posed by drug cartels in Mexico and Federal strategies to confront those challenges. Tragically, over 30,000 citizens of Mexico have been killed there in the last four years in wanton drug violence. There are many real challenges that undermine our mission to secure our borders, but almost by all accounts today, Environmental restrictions are not one of them. Mr. Chairman, I look forward to working with you to identify and tackle the very real challenges that do confront our border security. Thank you. I thank the gentleman for his opening statement. Um, I am prepared to give mine at this particular time. Look, I am glad that we are all here on this particular process, um, and especially that we will be joined by a couple of people. Representative Grijalva, who will be here lately, or will be here soon. Uh, Representative Giffords, who we pray for a speedy recovery to soon join us, and Representative Pierce, who has joined us on the dais, represent the areas that are most impacted. And I appreciate that their significance and their problem as they try to tell their constituents why they are being inundated with a problem that basically has solutions that we could find here in Washington if we wished. The issue is illegal entrance into this country. And I think the bottom line has to be that it is unacceptable. Even one is unacceptable, but what is happening today is unacceptable. Homeland Security, the Forest Service, and Department of Interior all have a responsibility in here, 
And the bottom line is what you are doing isn't working. The status quo is unacceptable. If things are getting better, and the GA report said in some areas it is getting better, that is positive. But it is not good enough. And it is not just people coming across the border searching for a better life. What is a concern for us is that the people who are coming across the border are the drug cartels who are destroying the lives of our kids with illegal drugs. They are prostitution rings. They are human traffickers. There are people who are being assaulted and raped and murdered on American land, and that is unacceptable. And what is worse, American citizens living in this area are being threatened and being killed, and that is simply unacceptable. If I can have map, uh, I think map two up there, which shows, I ain't map two. That's it. Which shows all the regions that have been coming here from the last bit of data. Now, some of those regions are doing very well. I think the number of people who have been apprehended in Maine has been, I think, numbers 56, which, which shows that Canadians from Nova Scotia are not coming here to take our hockey jobs. But in each of the last two years for which we have numbers, it's about a half million people have been apprehended. That's the ones we caught, not the ones who came in. And if you look at the numbers, over a quarter of a million of all those went through the Tucson sector by itself. Fifty-one percent of those who are coming into this country are coming through that one sector. And no wonder you, you can understand why Arizona reacted the way it did and passed that legislation in their state legislature, because that's almost 1,000 people a day being apprehended through their sector alone. And Tucson isn't all of, all of Arizona. You've got Yuma in there at the same time. So the question has to be, why is that the access of choice for those coming in here. Can I have map one? This is the borderland. By definition and judicial risk, borderland is 100 miles above the border. Everything red on that map is owned by the federal government. In places where we are having success, there's not a whole lot of red. In the places where the problem exists, it is red. GEO report said 97 percent of all the apprehensions are now coming on federal lands. When we built the fence, 36 laws were, were, were waived in order to build the fence. One makes the assumption that those 36 may indeed, have a pro, may indeed have a reason in the problem that Border Patrol has in securing the borders right now. Department of Interior, I'm sorry, but your response so far has been number eight, which is to set up a sign telling Americans not to go on American property. Now, the outrage at these signs was secure, was major, and you pulled them down, which is right, but the attitude has not changed. A sovereign country has to control its sovereign lands, and we're not doing that, and that is simply unacceptable. It is still unsafe for Americans to go into America, and that is simply unacceptable. The representative from Homeland Security will come in here and basically tell us that things are fine. That we're, get, we're getting along. We're improving. I just want you to know I don't buy it. I don't buy it because the logical assumption of that testimony means Border Patrol is incompetent to do their job, and I don't believe that for one second. I believe the Border Patrol is competent to do their job, but there are frustrations with the Department of Interior and the Forest Service, and if I could have number four, I believe, that, in, that prohibits them. These are the old barriers we used to have along the border. They have been removed as we have gotten better barriers. And now one land manager, under the direction of the Department of Interior, used these borders not to secure the border, but to stop the Border Patrol from entering into areas he did not wish them to enter. That is unacceptable. The Border Patrol can do their job if they are allowed to do their job. Even Senator Bingaman, who is not a hawk on the border, introduced a wilderness bill for New Mexico and recognized in his bill that there should be a five-mile strip along the border in which the Border Patrol had total access. He got the right idea. He just had the numbers wrong. Five miles doesn't cut it. The GAO report that came to us, a lot of people have taken one sentence out of, out of context, which said that 22 of the 26 stations said things are fine, unaffected by land management practices. However, if you read the entire report and went down to page 32, you would see that what they said is, in other words, no portions of these stations' jurisdiction has, have had their border security status, such as controlled, managed, or monitored, downgraded as a result of land management laws. To me, that is not the same thing, especially if you look at the rest of the report and see how 17 out of 26 of the stations said they did have monitoring delays and portions of their programs were delayed. 14 out of 17 did say they could not get waivers from land managers in a timely manner. 
they, they, the majority did say cooperation has not, only, not always occurred. The data is not accurate. As it says, some land managers monitor at, at areas in a rot routine basis, some document on an ad hoc basis, still others collect no data at all. The EIS statement can take over 75 days to accomplish. Three out of seven said the wilderness restrictions cause a problem for them. Five out of seven said the Endangered Species Act causes a problem for them. There was, in one area in Arizona, it took four months to get permission to move a mobile surveillance system. And the reason for it, according to the manager down there, he has limited staff with numerous other priorities. This was not important to him. In a place in Arizona, it took six months to get permission to improve roads that the Border Patrol needed on Bureau of Man Land Management land to conduct patrols and surveillance equipment. Eight months in another area to allow improvements for truck transportation to move an underground sensor that didn't take place. I find it interesting that in some places it simply never happened. Border agent in charge told us that maintenance was needed for five roads and two surveillance system sites within the station of operation, but they did not receive permission at all. So without the, these maintained roads, the agents could not conduct routine patrols or reach the sites for mobile service systems, even in an area of high illegal traffic. In another area where there are few roads, the agent said one additional road on an east-west corridor could close close to the border would be effective to combat the 8,000 miles of trails that undocumented workers have produced in this particular system. In another area of the National Forest, they actually approved for helicopter landings because of its remoteness, and that's great, but unfortunately everything was delayed until 2011. Contrasting two previous examples when Border Patrol requested additional access in another national park, Wilderness area, the management land manager determined that additional Border Patrol access would not improve the protection of the resources. So, he, so what happened is they put those surveillance on land that is owned by the state of Arizona, not by the federal government, and it still created a three-mile hole in the surveillance for undocumented workers. The land manager requested the Border Patrol to find a different location for the tower because of Wilderness Act restrictions. And he explained that the Border Patrol did not demonstrate to him that the proposed tower was critical. He made the final decision, not the experts on the Border Patrol area. And I'm sorry, the witnesses will tell you the mem memo of understanding is working. No, it's not. I'm glad that you're becoming chummier with the memo of understanding. But the memo of understanding is not the same thing as border security. The memo of understanding is not a solution. It is a process, and the process that the numbers show you on the first slide is simply not working. The results of that memo are unacceptable. The memo has failed, it was designed to fail, and it prohibits the Border Patrol from simply and frank actually doing their job. What the memo does is confer what people on the ground have contended and what Washington has denied. What we have to do is regain control of our lands from the drug cartels. National security has to be our number one issue. To, to take a phrase from Bill Clinton, it's national security stupid. If the fence needed 36 waivers to be done, Border Patrol needs those same kind of situations. Border Patrol should not be stopped or inhibited in anything they try to do. The environment is being trashed by illegal entry. It is not national security that is threatening our environment. It is the lack of national security that is threatening our environment. The Department of Interior must have better priorities so that human life takes a higher priority over what they are looking right now with the blinders that they have. Environmental laws and border security are in conflict. You're going to hear a lot of spin today, especially from the next panel of witnesses. One may hope, if I can phrase once again from Man for All Seasons, that when your head quits spinning, it will be facing towards the front. What is happening right now is not acceptable, and it has to change. All right, I appreciate your patience in that. Once again, when Mr. Grijalva arrives, we'll have his opening statement. I want to thank you. We have uh, previously recognized Mr. Reyes, who, who will be here. We have approved your presence here. We, we noted that you would be the first speaker for us. Your timing is impeccable. You came at just the right time to give your statement. And we appreciate the service and the history that you bring to it as one of those Border Patrol workers that did such a great job in an area where you were allowed to do a great job. You're recognized, Mr. Reyes. Well, well thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, Mr. Chairman as well, and Ranking Member uh, Tierney and I know uh, uh, Ranking Member Grijalva is probably on his way. I just saw him speaking on the floor. But thank you for giving me an opportunity uh, to be here to uh, lend my comments to very important work that your two respective committees uh, are, are doing. Uh, I guess one of the, one of the th first points I want to make and, and underscore is oftentimes uh, uh, 
we that rep both that represent border uh, districts and those that are elected to leadership positions uh, in the border uh, area uh, get frustrated because decisions made uh, here, particularly at the Federal level, often uh, impact the uh, communities and the relationship between communities and uh, the uh, Customs and Border Protection and other law enforcement uh, agencies uh, uh, that have very important uh, work to do to secure uh, the nation. So uh, I want to tell you how much I appreciate the opportunity not just to be here this morning, but I actually uh, was part of a field hearing that you did in Brownsville, uh, Texas, where the community got a chance uh, both to testify and also to observe a hearing uh, in, in process. Just last week, uh, the uh, Committee on Homeland Security on the Senate side, uh, uh, Senator Lieberman's committee, asked uh, uh, my county judge to come up and, and give testimony. So she was up here and, in fact, uh, uh, made a number of points that I want to reinforce here uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, I represent the safest city in the United States of over 500,000 people or more. It is interesting to note that five of our border cities, to include uh, the two largest one, El Paso and San Diego, uh, and uh, McAllen, uh, Laredo, uh, and Tucson, are in fact on the top ten list of safest city uh, in the country. The reason I mention that is because oftentimes the rhetoric does not match what we are experiencing, those of us that live on the border. The border is not a lawless region. The border is not uh, an area that is out of control. Uh, I can't say enough about the work that the Border Patrol uh, is doing. I can't say enough about uh, the cooperation that exists to make sure that border communities are secure, uh, feel secure, uh, and our job is to make sure that, that the facts uh, come out. So when, when we talk about uh, uh, the border region, I would strongly recommend that you do a series of, of hearings, in particular uh, maybe in those cities that are among the safest uh, cities uh, in the country. I speak from a perspective of having spent 26 and a half years uh, working uh, the border, working my way up from an agent, uh, working five years in, in the Del Rio uh, area, Del Rio sector. Uh, and then being chief uh, in two other areas, South Texas and, and uh, El Paso, where I was born and, and raised. So uh, I always uh, want to make sure that, as the only member of Congress with that background, that uh, I get an opportunity to at least provide what, what I feel is very important, and that is uh, accurate information about what is going on. And I don't expect people to take my word for it. I, I, I welcome, uh, and in fact, we have had a number of hearings both in El Paso and other areas that I have joined uh, both this committee and other committees that have that responsibility uh, to take testimony, but most importantly, to actually go out there and see the work that is being done by our Border Patrol agents, see the work that is being done uh, in concert with uh, other agencies, both Federal, State, and local, which is very important, uh, the cooperation that exists. I, I wanted to give one example of uh, how that cooperation is important by citing a recent uh, uh, issue that, that existed in my community, and that was the there is one last uh, uh, section of fencing that, that needs to uh, take place uh, right near our downtown area in El Paso. Uh, in that area is also uh, the water source that is literally 12 minutes away from the water treatment plant uh, that um, when it was initially proposed to fence that area would have, would have put that uh, water source uh, south of the fencing. So thanks to the cooperation of the Customs and Border Protection, uh, consulting with the community, uh, we came up with a uh, uh, compromise that we are going to 
close off uh, that canal so that uh, people that are intend intending on uh, maybe uh, take taking uh, uh, some kind of a terrorist act against uh, the United States don't have access to that water uh, uh, system. So we'll close it off. The Border Patrol will get their fins, and the fins will also protect some infrastructure that the city was concerned about that is critical in, in uh, controlling the water runoff uh, during storms. Those are the kinds of cooperative uh, and uh, consultation efforts that make sense uh, in our communities. And uh, I guess today uh, I would ask that the decisions that are recommended from this, uh, from this committee be done with that spirit in mind, that uh, we oftentimes uh, want to make decisions, for, for instance, uh, putting up a very expensive uh, uh, fence in areas that really don't need it, in areas where we can monitor it electronically, where agents have sufficient time to respond once those intrusions are, uh, uh, are known. Uh, they're the, they're the experts. I uh, retired from the Border Patrol over 15 years ago, uh, but I still uh, am very much interested, keep in contact, and uh, am proud to say that uh, they're my, not just my former colle colleagues, but my friends, and uh, we need to do everything that we can to support them, both uh, uh, because it's America's first line of defense, but most importantly because the Border Patrol works uh, on the theory that it's uh, always better uh, to consult with the local community because they are part of that community uh, so that uh, both priorities are reached, both the, the enforcement priority and the community priority, as I, I just uh, spoke about with the uh, uh, example I gave you. The last point I want to make is that uh, when I retired, we had uh, a little over 5,000 agents in the whole Border Patrol. We've done a very good job of increasing the size of the Border Patrol. Today, there's over 20,000 agents. There's one area that I'm concerned about that we haven't focused on, and I hope we get a chance uh, to do that, and that's at the ports of entry. Uh, today, we're seeing alarming statistics of uh, the amounts of narcotics that are being uh, intercepted at those ports of entry. And across the nation, those ports of entry are carrying on a normal uh, uh, average about a 31 to 38 percent uh, vacancy ratio in their ranks. That means uh, many different uh, things, including the fact that it, it creates a, a vulnerable environment for our country, but it also means long waiting lines for people wanting to cross the border. And obviously, it also means that, based on the statistics we're seeing, that more narcotics are coming through those ports of entry because that workforce is overwhelmed. So I hope we get a chance uh, uh, to have hearings on increasing the size of uh, officers at those ports of entry. I know that uh, when you uh, uh, if you ask uh, Border Patrol uh, here this morning, they can tell you the same thing and verify the fact that uh, it doesn't uh, make sense to have control in between the ports of, uh, of entry and not at those ports of entry that account for millions of entries every single day from uh, Mexico into the United States and also from Canada into the United States. So. Uh, with that, thank you for giving me an opportunity uh, to uh, testify before you this morning, and I would be uh, happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Mr. Reyes. We're going to be respectful of your time, but does anyone have questions for the gentleman from Texas? Representative Chaffetz, go ahead. Go ahead. Thank you. <clears throat> Thanks for being here. and. and uh, I know you, uh, you care as much about uh, this issue as anybody. Um, from your perspective, um, Border Patrol agents are putting their lives on the line. They are going into inhospitable areas, uh, with people that they don't know, that they are trying to apprehend. Concern is the rural areas, particularly where we have some environmental laws that prohibit the use of vehicles and other types of things. 
Can you really look somebody in the eye and say, you know, if you do this on foot, you are going to be equally as secure and safe and as effective as you would if you were in a vehicle? I mean, that, that is my concern, is that, you know, and part of the testimony that we are about to hear in the written testimony, though, is that Kim Thorson uh, from Interior said, quote, on any Federal lands at any time, you may patrol on foot or on horseback. I can't imagine looking at some Border Patrol agent in the eye and say, you know, sir, sorry, you can't use the vehicle here with all the communications tools and safety and security and speed that you can get. You guys go out on foot. Is that really what we should be telling our, our Border Patrol agents? Well, not so much on foot, but I will tell you my experience has always been uh, Border Patrol is a hardy bunch. They, uh, uh, they love patrolling on horseback, and, and there are a number of reasons for that. Not only uh, does it provide quick access uh, in in very uh, rough uh, terrain, but they but it also uh, allows them uh, to have a higher uh, uh, perspective of of whatever is uh, ahead of them, and they can uh, ride up on on uh, groups of people much faster and uh, much safer. If you rely on than a vehicle, a, than a vehicle. Uh, if you rely on a well, remember what we're talking about are the areas that that you just mentioned uh, are very rough terrain, very uneven terrain. Yes, we have uh, things but, like but hummers, four wheel flat drive. Some of it is as can be, right? I mean, some of it is some some of it is. I mean, it's not all mountainous. No, no, it's not. But but. Uh, I, I guess from my perspective, from my experience, it just makes sense uh, to uh, give the tools to the Border Patrol uh, that they need. And in some of these areas, uh, what they want are uh, the, the ability to, to patrol on horseback. But, but uh, who, the, I guess the core, core question there is who should make that decision? Shouldn't that be the decision of the Border Patrol to say this is how we are going to secure our folks? Well, the, the law says that the, uh, the Border Patrol has the right uh, of access anywhere, unrestricted anywhere within 25 miles of an international uh, border. Uh, they have that uh, uh, authority. But the chiefs locally I wish that was true. My understanding is that is not true. No, it, well, on my, my understanding is that is on private property, but not on public lands. I mean, the issue here is, for instance, the Oregon Pipe National Forest is, is, is one of the big issues and, there. And, and, I, and I know the They area. can't do that. And I know the area. They have to go get permission from somebody who doesn't have the best interests of the Border Patrol in mind. They doesn't have to deal with the fact that they are going to ask somebody to go risk their life out on this, on this public property. Well, I have been, I've, I've been there. I have seen that, that area. Uh, I have talked to the chiefs uh, that have been in charge of those areas, uh, they don't have a problem uh, of access because, uh, uh, at least the ones that I've talked to, uh, because they do uh, uh, patrol that area effectively. They have the same concerns that that Chairman Bishop articulated, and that is, from an environmental uh, perspective, the water jugs, the plastic bags, and all of that st stuff that uh, undocumented people uh, uh, leave. Uh, are, 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 are an issue for them, but access and the ability to patrol, and I am not speaking for them, they will be testifying, right. and, uh, but I, I am telling you both from my experience and from talking to the chiefs in those areas, uh, they don't, at least they have not told me that they are denied access to that area. I, I guess I want to conclude it within my, my scope of time. I guess the point I am trying to drive home is the Border Patrol should be making those types of decisions whether or not they use a horse or foot or vehicle. And that is my driving point. Would you disagree or agree with that point? I, I would not disagree, although Thank don't, you. don't Thank discount you. the fact that uh, the chiefs that are in charge of those areas have the best interest of officer safety in mind first and foremost. But they, they also, you, you know, one of the things that I have learned through my experience is uh, no one is more uh, uh, attuned, and, and I, I, I go back to saying the Border Patrol is a hardy bunch, no one is more attuned uh, to the surroundings, uh, to, the, to respecting nature and those kinds of things. That is why I mentioned to you one of the biggest complaints that I have heard uh, is about the refuse that is left behind by undocumented people. 
Thank you. You're back. Mr. Tierney. I Sorry, Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Have questions for your colleague? Yes, I do. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Reyes, thank you for joining us here this morning. Uh, and I, I do respect the fact that you have, I think, more experience certainly than any member of Congress uh, in, uh, at your job on, on the Border Patrol, but you have also since been a member, been very focused on this area and continue because of your district, obviously, to be in touch with people that are on that, which strikes me as we sort of be trying to impose on you here some of the questions, you know, uh, an outsider's view that you have got the experience, but we still want to tell you what works right. on that. And, and what I am hearing from you is that basically when there is an environmental law or regulation that might touch up on a conflict uh, with a security issue, that has been your experience that the agencies involved have been able to work it out pretty reasonably. Is that is correct. Okay. That's correct. Um, my understanding also is the memorandum of understanding between different agencies is that when uh, there is an area of uh, exigency, whether it be hot pursuit or some other security issue, the Border Patrol actually does have the ability to use motorized vehicles. Is that right? That is correct. Uh, no, that I know of, nowhere on the border under emergency uh, uh, situations is the Border Patrol precluded from doing whatever it needs, needs to, to do. do. All right. Uh, and I, uh, there was a question here a moment ago about you know, who makes a decision. Well, we have laws in this country, and I, I would suspect that those prevail, am I right, at least in terms Correct. of? And you find the agencies generally try to implement those laws. Terrific. And then the memorandum of understanding is a way to try to reconcile any conflicts that might uh, appear within those laws. Correct. Uh, and your experience has been that the agencies have been able to effectively, uh, under that memorandum of agreement and through other cooperative means, uh, resolve any issues or problems for the most part that come up under that. Uh, that's been my experience, yes. Okay. And, and I'm just reading on that. The Border Patrol may access lands by motorized vehicle or otherwise in exigent or emergency situations, and that seems to cover any ground of it when it comes up to a final decision. The Border Patrol decides it's uh, an exigency or an emergency, and they need to have use a vehicle, and they go. Has that been your experience? Uh, yes, it has. And, you know, you, you've got to remember that uh, there, are, there are times when perhaps you've got an airplane crash, you've got a You've got some other kind of emergency. An, an agent is shot. Uh, the uh, border patrol uh, uh, chiefs are not are, are not going to allow anything to interfere with being able to get in there uh, and do whatever needs to be done to to both secure the area and most importantly uh, take care of whatever officer is injured. Well, it appears, at least from this perspective, that our laws don't interfere with that either, that, that they are set up they do not. the laws absolutely. and the agreements under them to allow that to happen, in fact. That, absolutely. So has it been your experience that, that there are other factors involved in, uh, in sometimes causing difficulty for Border Patrol agents or others to uh, get control over a particular area, uh, in, in topography or, uh, or uh, you know, the geography of an area? Are they sometimes more of an impediment for the agencies? Oh, sure. That, well, sure. And, and that is why Again, the, the chief in the sector uh, knows that area best. Uh, he's in constant uh, uh, communication with uh, both the agent in charge of whatever area uh, is in uh, uh, the station that, that you're describing. Uh, and decisions are made both in terms of uh, being able to secure the area and how they would respond. Uh, uh, and with what they would, would respond. I mean, that's, that's the Chief's responsibility, to make sure that in the case of a national emergency or an emergency affecting officer safety or the safety of maybe a rancher or maybe an undocumented person uh, whose life is in jeopardy, they will, uh, they will uh, make uh, whatever decision uh, needs to be made and have that access with, without any problem. How many years, Mr. Reyes, were you a member of the Border Patrol? Twenty-six and a half. So twenty-six and a half years as a Border Patrol agent and chief, uh, fifteen years in Congress representing an area that is very involved in that and your conversations with the various agencies, representatives and employees uh, along there. How many instances are you aware of where uh, an environmental law or one of the other laws that we were discussing this morning was an insurmountable impediment to the Border Patrol doing its work? I, I can't think of, of, of any. There, uh, we, in fact, I will tell you, Border Patrol agents work very closely in Texas with what we we know as tick riders, and they their job and their responsibility is to make sure that cattle does not come over from from Mexico uh, because of uh, uh, the kinds of diseases that they would have. So Border Patrol works very closely. I worked with them when I was an agent. We work very closely uh, with uh, the Parks and Wildlife. Uh, uh, people. Uh, 
uh, on occasion, uh, DPS, the Department of Public, Public Safety, uh, and uh, park rangers in, in general in the areas that they uh, have a presence. So uh, when you are wearing a badge and you have that responsibility, uh, you want to make sure that to the extent uh, uh, possible that you have uh, both knowledge of who is there and an understanding that, that they are going to uh, come to your assistance and you are going to go to their assistance uh, because of the, both the environment and the hostility of the area or perhaps uh, uh, either a drug smuggler, or alien smuggler or others that might uh, not distinguish and not know the difference between a Border Patrol agent, a park ranger, a tick rider, and, and others. Well, thank you for coming this morning and sharing your extensive experience uh, and from a range of perspectives. Thank you. This is my good friend from Michigan. Do you have any questions of Mr. Reyes? Uh, just uh, a statement. Um, I am from Michigan, and we border on Canada, so we have to sometimes look at our northern border also. And uh, generally, those who do try to get into Michigan either come in by plane from Europe, the one uh, uh, person they caught uh, trying to bring a plane into Detroit, but by water. And I have been impressed by the cooperation between uh, the, the Border Patrol and the Forest Service and our Coast Guard. There are three very important, and I, I think we have to encourage that cooperation. And sometimes uh, laws have to catch up with changed circumstances. And if uh, if there is a need for change in laws, uh, hearings like this might help that. I am not sure there is a need if there is already good cooperation. But I do appreciate uh, your service to your district, your state, this country, and to this Congress. Thank you very much. And, and I would just add the Royal uh, Canadian Mounted Police Border Patrol has outstanding, uh, an outstanding working uh, relation and history uh, with them as, as well, because we uh, uh, at least it's been uh, it's been the history that most of the resources have been on the southern border with Mexico because that's where the pressure is. Uh, so we have less officers, and they depend on relationships with uh, uh, local uh, law enforcement like the RCMP uh, up there. So well, one good b uh, border patrol person, uh, Diana Dean, helped apprehend uh, Ahmed uh, Ressam, who was up to no good at all. She yeah. she was her training and her perception was able to uh, stop that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dale. Appreciate it very much. Uh, the chairman, who is the official member of this committee, is here. I will recognize him, then we will recognize Representative Pierce from New Mexico. I will be quick. Have you been sworn in? Because I got a lot of questions for you. <laughs> Uh, I think every, every time you testify before Congress, <laughs> the assumption is you are sworn in. We have always sworn at him, but we yeah, haven't sworn in. Yeah. <laughs> Congressman, thank you for being here, and thank, thank you so much for bringing us an inside view from an uh, outside agency. So that is the only reason I showed up here was uh, I said, wait a second here, not only is this my committee room, this is one of my best friends in yeah. Congress and somebody I rely on for the kind of advice you just gave. So thank you. That is all I wanted to say. Well, and, and, and thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, because uh, uh, as I have said publicly on, on occasion, many times while we may differ in our, in our politics, I think we all want to do what is best for uh, our national security and the protection. And how we, how we get there really is uh, uh, I think the important part, uh, yeah. for for uh, for many different reasons, these guys are the are the experts. Uh, uh, I have I have I thank God that I have that that background because uh, uh, I really enjoyed my 26 and a half years uh, uh, in the in the border patrol. I don't think there's a finer law enforcement group uh, uh, in the world than than uh, than the border patrol. Uh, but as you can uh, expect, I. I'm probably a little biased, but uh, well, they do, they it's do part great of what work. we know about you is you used to be somebody. Yes, <laughs> thank you, <laughs> thank you. But thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. And thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You must be something special. He's never said anything that nice to me. <laughs> Thanks a lot. In Rep time, in yeah, time. Yeah. Representative Pierce. Well, remember he was a member of uh, my committee when I was chairman of the Intelligence. Uh, uh, committee, and we worked on many different issues. Uh, you know, one of the so you're telling me you got photos or something? No, <laughs> not, not that I'm aware of. But we <laughs> did we did work on some really tough stuff that will never 
that people will never know publicly. Uh, but, but again, it's about the national security of our country. Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to be here uh, on this committee uh, and thank uh, my neighbor for his decades of service both in the Border Patrol and, and here in Congress. Um, the more a comment than a question, I am hearing what you are saying, that uh, El Paso is the safest city in the U.S., less than 15 miles. I mean, our, our El Paso bumps up against right. some of the towns in my district and 15 miles from downtown El Paso. They literally bar their windows and doors, and they don't feel like they are in the safest place in, in the world. They, in fact, just uh, about two weeks ago in Anthony, uh, they declared their streets to be completely unsafe and uh, what, what can be done about it. And so it is it's such a contrast from, uh, from the safest city to, to just 15 miles away. Uh, wasn't there a, a major highway that was shut down in El Paso last year because of gunfire? Was that the year before? No. no and, and just to comment about it, Anthony is not on the border. No, I'm, and, I'm and, Sunland Park is on the border, but right. I was in Anthony. Sunland right. Park is the same. They they feel uh, they express uh, tremendous uh, well, concern if, for the safety. If you uh, at least we have to separate criminal activity by non non uh, uh, illegal aliens that are coming through the area. And Anthony's uh, streets were declared unsafe because of gang activity. The the warring gangs. There, which occurs throughout anywhere in, the, in this in this country, but the uh, the border highway, which literally runs right along the Rio Grande River, uh, is uh, is uh, the road that you were uh, referring to. Uh, and yes, there was a gunfight that occurred in Juarez, which which uh, uh, may be the most violent city. Certainly, it's the most violent city in the Americas, but may be the, one of the most violent cities. Uh, in the uh, world because of the uh, friction among the, the cartels. Uh, but there were bullets. Uh, the concern by the uh, police department was uh, uh, that a stray bullet might hit a passing in car there. Uh, it is it's just uh, uh, a consequence of the location of of that uh, that highway. Sure. By if the I way, could, that, that if I could reclaim my time, uh, go Mr. Ahead. Chairman, I would point out that uh, that the gang signs, the MP, uh, whatever the gang signs are from uh, Mexico, Central America, have appeared on barns uh, in in the Second District of New Mexico, and, and it alarms people. Then we had the the rancher that was killed. Uh, his ranch butted up against those ranches of ours. In the uh, 26 and a half years that you served. What uh, wilderness areas did you actually uh, were in in your jurisdiction, right under your command? What, which wilderness areas did you uh, formal des designation of wilderness? Well, um, as an agent, I worked the what what is known as the Amistad uh, Lake uh, area. Uh, is that wilderness? Is well, that designated wilderness? Uh, sections are, in fact, uh, uh, some of the because of the. Uh, uh, excavations uh, of some of the caves there that with uh, uh, hieroglyphics and all of, all of that, th they have been uh, uh, put under the jurisdiction of, uh, I believe, the Department of the, of the Interior. Uh, it's a uh, it, it's an area. Amistad Lake, as as you know, like Falcon Lake, is uh, right on the border. Half of it is in Mexico, and the other half is in in the United States. And we had. The responsibility okay. for, Thank you. for the Mr. U.S. Chairman, side. If I could reclaim my time, I am about to run out here. But I would just observe that Mr. Bingaman submitted a bill last year and the year before to make wilderness on, on the area. And in contrast to your assertion that we had 25 miles access in every wilderness area on, on any place from the border, he actually had to, as a compromise, designate that. Uh, we could get wheeled vehicles into a five-mile stretch, and that was a compromise. It, initially, it was not. Uh, and uh, wilderness, uh, the Hegel Wilderness, uh, a long time ago, uh, an airplane crashed uh, from my hometown in the Gila. They had to backpack the potties out. In other words, wilderness is a very restrictive designation. 
Uh, we've had testimony that if uh, we created the wilderness along the Rio Grande, that they would not be able to actually get bulldozers in to replace the earthen dams that washed out in the flood about three years ago, and, uh, and then we would be subject to flooding for the rest of the time. So wilderness area, I have got the Gila wilderness in my, uh, in, in my district. I went to the Oregon Pipe National Monument and I saw the signs and, and we had the formal briefing that half of that was completely off limits to American tourists. Uh, because uh, the, of, of the illegal activity across the border. And if our agents were able to access that, it doesn't seem like that it would be off limits to American uh, tourists because it was so dangerous. Uh, many places in New Mexico, only a barbed wire fence uh, is there on the border. Uh, but again, I yield back my time. Uh, Mr. Chairman, yes. if, I can, if, if I can respond, the International and I'll give you boundary, 10, 15 seconds. Okay, the International Boundary and Water Commission has the authority to, uh, to do the kind of work that, uh, irrespective of wilderness designations, that uh, Mr. Pierce was talking about in terms of levees and dams and, and all of that. I, I think if you check that out, it will uh, uh, be clear who has got the jurisdiction. Mr. Reyes, I just want to give the benediction to your presentation here today by thanking you for being here. Uh, the written statement that you gave, uh, I, I actually agreed with point after point out that our cities are improving. The Border Patrol is doing a great job there. In fact, one of the GA report studies simply said the Border Patrol has put, as there's, in their words, put a strategy on high priority on border enforcement in urban and populated areas. It does work. The Border Patrol can do their job when they are allowed to. But it has had the process of diverting large concentrations of illegal traffic to the federal lands and in the remote areas where you are talking. I agree with you as well that the agents should be able to respond as best they can. I agree also there are some areas that are so rugged fencing is not a legitimate uh, option for it, but indeed uh, access by the Border Patrol is. Uh, and, and sometimes they do use horses better, although Secretary Napolitano did say it may be inadvisable. Uh, for officer safety to await for the arrival of a horse for the purposes to apprehend somebody. That sometimes is, is a difficult, and also we will remember that all those horses are fed weed feed pellets because you can't have perfect kind of horses. I also agree with you on three other points, that um, local consultation should be the best basis of making those kinds of decisions. I agree with what you said on the exigent or emergency circumstances, although I will tell you that the MOU does have a definition of what those are, and they have not always been maintained by the land managers. There have been times when land managers have told them, have told the Border Patrol different than what the MOU is supposed to do, and that will come out in our testimony later. And the last one is I definitely agree with a good idea you had on beefing up our port of entries. Um, <clears throat> actually, you said we should have more officers. I think you said we should have bigger staff there at the port of entry, which means size. So Mr. Chaffetz told me that what he's talking about are portly officers at the port of entries, in which case I took offense at that because he's talking right about me. So Mr. Reyes, I appreciate your being here. Thank you for your testimony. Thank you for being a part of this. And we thank you for that. And we'll let you go back and do some real work now. Thank you so much. And I look forward to working uh, with uh, you and your respective uh, committees on these very important issues for our country. Thank you very much. Great. We now have the next panel that will be joining us, but I understand the practice of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is for the witness to be sworn in. So I would like Representative Chaffetz. Maybe a four minute recess while they, re they got to address the table there. All right. Um, the next panel will come up very, very slowly to the panel as it gets set up for you. So if you want to come up slowly, don't stand up yet. That's too fast. <laughs> It's going to be a couple of seconds before we can get the situated up here. Uh, we will have, though, Ronald Viatello, and you can correct the pronunciation of that. I probably messed up everything. Viatello, who's the Deputy Chief of the U.S. Customs and Border Patrol, Kim Thorson, the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Law Enforcement Security of the Emergency Management from the Department of Interior, Jay Jensen, Deputy, Under, Deputy Undersecretary for Natural Resources, Environment, Department of Agriculture. I didn't mess up your twos because they're just good old Danish names, and I can handle that. But in one second, um, we would ask you, and I'll, I think I'm going to turn the chair over to Representative Chaffetz to take care of this portion. It is the practice of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee that all witnesses would be sworn in. So those three witnesses, as well as the um, backup 
witnesses to rise and raise your right hand, please. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that all, all participants an answered in the affirmative. Thank you. All right, it is our hope at this time that we, uh, before the next vote occurs, that we can have the testimony of the individuals who are there. Uh, I do not, do you care which order you go? Then let's take you from left to right. Uh, we'll start with, uh, with Homeland Security, go to Interior, and then finish up with the Agriculture Department. And once again, thank you for being here. Uh, as, as you should know, we, I just, you've been here long enough to know this stuff. Uh, everything is, your written testimony is in the record. Anything else you want to add, we can put into the record as well. The timer is in front of you. Uh, when the yellow button light comes on, you have one minute left. We'll try and close it as, as close to that red light as is possible. We set? Please. Chairman Bishop, Chairman Chavez, ranking members and distinguished members of the subcommittee, it's a privilege and honor to appear before you today to discuss U.S. Customs and Border Protection's efforts concerning illegal activity on Federal lands. I'm Ronald Vitello, the Deputy Chief of the United States Border Patrol. I began my career in law enforcement in 1985 as a Border Patrol agent in Laredo, Texas. Throughout my career, I've held numerous positions within the organization, both on the southern and northern borders. I would like to be clear that the border is a different place today than it was when I began my career. I have personally witnessed the evolution of the border over the past 26 years in both terms of additional resources applied against the threat, as well as the change in the adversary's ability to exploit border vulnerabilities. Last year, the Border Patrol apprehended approximately 463,000 illegal aliens as compared to 10 years ago when we made 1.6 million arrests, a more than 70 percent reduction. Although we have seen positive indicators of a more secure border, our work continues and will not end as long as those who seek to enter this country illegally. The Border Patrol's national strategy was implemented in 2004 and called for achieving control of the borders with a proper mix of personnel, tactical infrastructure and technology. We sought to gain, maintain and expand control at the border. With the assistance of Congress, we have seen unprecedented influx of resources and we are currently expanding our security efforts in law enforcement. We operate within the confines of the rule of law and regulations. Would our efforts be easier without these legal frameworks? Yes, it would. However, we find a way to reasonably and sensibly f uh, solve problems within the parameters of law. Does the Border Patrol cha face challenges with respect to operating around protected lands when they are in our enforcement zones? Yes. But again, we have been able to establish practical solutions to allow for mission success. In 2006, the Secretaries of the Departments of Homeland Security, Interior and Agriculture signed a Memorandum of Understanding committing the signatories to ongoing operations on protected lands. It is understood that the Border Patrol cannot routinely patrol protected land in vehicles. Nonetheless, we do have access either on foot, horseback and without restriction under exigent circumstances. Essentially, the MOU formalized an informal cooperation that has existed for years. Our field commanders, the chiefs and the patrol agent in charge are tasked to consider the multiple environments they oversee in order to establish their requirements for where resources are required and how to best apply them. Each tract of land along the border has to be assessed individually. As our commanders lay out the requirements, we work through the environmental regulations in order to abide by the law, albeit without sacrificing the Nation's security. Some of this activity can be time consuming, but in the end we have in place the necessary tactical infrastructure, technology or resources. Additionally, we look at the border. Each area has to be taken individually, as no two stretches are the same. The activity levels and terrain vary widely from San Diego to Brownsville on the southern border. Through our security efforts, the Border Patrol intends to have a minimal impact on the environment. Agents are on the line every day, day in and day out, interacting with the communities in which they live. There are many varying opinions from the border communities, public interest groups and the media alike, yet our mission is to enforce the laws duly enacted by Congress. The Border Patrol recognizes that we need many partners in our nation's security efforts. We have learned that it will take a whole of government approach within law enforcement, within each of our duties, responsibilities and authorities at all levels, Federal, State, local and tribal. We have strived to be moved beyond mere collaboration and work toward operational integration with our Federal, State, local and tribal and our international partners moving forward in realizing the strength of joint planning and implementation in a targeted and focused manner. 
Our path forward in our security efforts applied will be risk-based. Accordingly, we will increasingly depend on information and intelligence to describe the intent and capability of our adversaries, thus defining the threat while continuously assessing our vulnerabilities. In doing so, we must be more mobile, agile, and flexible. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I do look forward to your questions. Thank you, Chairman Chavitz and Bishop and members of the subcommittee. I appreciate the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the important issues of border security and the Department of the Interior's role in the Administration's collaborative efforts to address illegal cross-border activity on Federal lands. I am Kim Thorson and I am the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Law Enforcement Security and Emergency Management at Interior. I have been a law enforcement professional for 25 years with both Interior and the U.S. Forest Service, and I have been involved in border issues for the last eight years. I am joined here today by Jeannie Van Lackner, the Acting Director of the Office of Law Enforcement and Security for the Bureau of Land Management, Jim Hall, the Chief of Law Enforcement for the National Wildlife Refuge System of the Fish and Wildlife Service, and Lane Baker, the Chief of Law Enforcement Security and Emergency Services for the National Park Service. If I may, I would like to submit our full statement for the record and summarize my testimony. We appreciate the attention that your subcommittees have given to the issue of securing our borders. The Department of Homeland Security, including U.S. Customs and Border Protection and Border Patrol, has been given the mandate to secure our international borders and deter illegal border-related activity. At Interior, we have the responsibility of administering uniquely beautiful and environmentally sensitive lands along the borders. We recognize the significant ecological and cultural values of these lands, and we strive to maintain their character and fulfill our mission to protect and preserve these assets on behalf of the American people. We also recognize that these two objectives, securing our borders and conserving our Federal lands, are not mutually exclusive. We are not faced with the choice between the two. Instead, we can and should do both. We at Interior are proud of the strong working relationship based on cooperation and a mutual commitment to accomplishing our important agency missions among all of our partner agencies. Federal agencies with law enforcement presence on Federal lands along the borders include the Border Patrol, Interior's agencies including the Bureau of Land Management, National Park Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, and in certain circumstances the Bureau of Indian Affairs, and the Department of Agriculture's Forest Service. Our agencies have developed a cohesive cooperative approach to border security. In March 2006, Interior, DHS, and Agriculture entered into a memorandum of understanding providing the departments with goals, principles, and guidance related to securing the borders addressing emergencies involving human safety, and minimizing the environmental damage arising from illegal cross-border activities on Federal lands. We believe the guidelines contained in the MOU have been effective in providing both Interior and Border Patrol with the necessary framework to strike the appropriate balance for patrol and infrastructure access to Interior lands by Border Patrol, while continuing to maintain an emphasis on protection of Federal trust resources. Since entering into this MOU, the three departments have continually and successfully worked together to carry out the tenets outlined in the MOU at both the headquarters and the field levels. At Interior, we have established a department-wide coordination structure to facilitate the regular coordination and collaboration between Border Patrol and Interior agency representatives. Additionally, Interior, Agriculture, and DHS have found an interagency environmental and cultural stewardship training task force to build on existing environmental and cultural training for Border Patrol agents whose patrol activities include Federal lands. Collaboration is also taking place with the Border Patrol in the field. The Border Patrol, in cooperation with Interior and Agriculture, established a public lands liaison agent position for each of its 20 sectors. Interior land managers communicate and collaborate on issues of mutual interest or concern with those agents on a regular basis. In addition, Border Patrol agents frequently conduct joint patrols with Interior law enforcement personnel on Interior lands. This close coordination provides staff with training and orientation on each agency's mission, while enhancing homeland security activities and resource-related investigations. These few examples are just a sampling of the ongoing collaborative dialogue and strong relationship that Interior agencies and personnel have developed with our colleagues in the Border Patrol. The deployment of Border Patrol personnel, equipment, and infrastructure along the southwest border has led to significant improvements in border security. We are very pleased with these improvements because of the enhanced security to our nation and also because these efforts lead to overall healthier conditions on interior lands along the border. During this deployment of additional border security resources, we have worked closely and well with the Border Patrol to avoid or mitigate impacts of these operations on Federal lands. 
In closing, I would like to recognize the collective efforts that Interior, DHS, and Agriculture have taken to meet the intent of the 2006 Interagency MOU and the shared commitment by our departments to accomplishing the missions of our agencies. Chairman Chavitz and Bishop, this concludes my statements. I would be pleased to answer any questions that you or other members of the subcommittees may have. Thank you, Mr. Jansen. Thank you, Chairman Bishop, Chairman Chaffetz, Ranking Member Tierney, members of the subcommittees. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to present to provide the Department's views on border security on national forest system lands. You have my written testimony for the record, but I would like to take this time to emphasize some key points. First, the Department and the Forest Service take very seriously the need to secure our nation's border. We fully support, as it is in our common interest, that we address illegal U.S. border crossings, the smuggling of illicit contraband and people across the border, the crimes committed against those being smuggled, and other unlawful activities. Through all of this, it is important to recognize and empathize with the plight of those undocumented foreign nationals who are seeking a better life. Yet, these, there, are import, there, are, there are impacts to national forests on both the northern and southern borders, particularly so on portions of the Coronado National Forest we are seeing issues related to excessive trash, human-caused fire, and the safety of the recreating public. We are undertaking successful measures to mitigate these impacts. Second, I want to emphasize the close working relationship we have with the Border Patrol and our sister agencies in the Department of the Interior. As our testimony indicates, we participate in numerous joint patrol exercises, have assigned a full-time U.S. Forest Service liaison to the Border Patrol, communicate in real time on the ground with each other and work expeditiously to allow the Border Patrol the access they need while protecting the environment. In fact, just a few weeks ago, the Forest Service Chief, Tom Tidwell, was in southern Arizona meeting with Chief Hill of the Tucson sector of the Border Patrol. They toured the border by helicopter to see and learn firsthand the challenges we face together. There is much to do, but we are seeing success. And to reinforce, the, the General Accounting Office has even acknowledged the close cooperation between our agencies. Third, we are convinced that a well-protected border means well-protected public lands. The more we can assist the Border Patrol with stopping illegal traffic, the less impact there will be on the national forests. To date, we are unaware of any requests made by the Border Patrol where we have not been able to accommodate their needs in an expeditious manner and still protect the environment. Lastly, we want to thank the subcommittees for their attention to this important issue. We want to work closely with you and understand your concerns. Our experience to date tells us that we can accomplish our missions of securing the border and protecting the environment, recognizing that these are not mutually exclusive objectives. We will continue to make interagency inter progress with the Border Patrol and our sister agencies in the Department of the Interior to an accomplishment of our missions. This concludes my verbal testimony. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. I appreciate all of you being here. Let me ask the first round of questions. Um, Looking at the, for, for eat, all of you, looking at the memo of understanding, it appears that a big part of the entire agreement hinges on access granted in the course of exigent or emergency circumstances. Ms. Thorson, you're from DOI. Let me go with you. What is an, an exigent circumstance? Mr. Chairman, as outlined in the MOU, what we tried to do is ensure that the Border Patrol agent and then in their judgment, determined what an exigent circumstance was, whether it was in pursuit of aliens. Is uh, there a the, definition in the MOU? Yes. And what is that definition? Exercising ed existing ed ex exigent emergency authorities to access lands, including authority to conduct off motorized off-road pursuit of suspected CB CBBs at any time, including in areas designated or recommended as wilderness or in wilderness study areas, when, in their professional judgment based on articulated facts, there is a specific exigent emergency involving human life, health, safety of persons within the area, or posing a threat to national security. Okay, that's the key element. So human life, health, safety of persons within the area, or posing a threat to national security. Are you aware that when my staff questioned one of your uh, park superintendents and even the director of the National Park Service told us separately that an exigent circumstance is life or death only? Now, is that what the MOU says? No. Okay. 
So this incorrect definition is not just the opinion of the Park Service. Unfortunately, the Fish and Wildlife Service Director sent two letters to the Border Patrol telling them, in his opinion, that an emergency is defined as life-threatening circumstances, and otherwise Border Patrol has to continue to access the refuge on foot or on horseback, and also gave them a warning that if they, if they violated his version of that MOU, within six months he would close all access down. Are you aware of that? Um, no, I am not aware of those particular What are you going to do about it? Well, what we will do is um, ensure, and we are continually doing this with our partners, um, our agencies on the ground and with the Border Patrol, to ensure that the MOU is enforced as written. It is nice. So that you are, you are now aware that the ground personnel and DOI are not un operating under the same definition. You got it? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Well, you were right when saying that, that, uh, that protection of the land and protection of the border should not be mutually exclusive, that you should be able to do both. Unfortunately, you are not. Border Patrol agents in the fields have explained to our staff that they believe the MOU could work, but unfortunately it does not because the land agencies do not follow it. Mr. Vitello, have you heard complaints from the field land managers that they, that they are not following the MOU? I think that the, that the MOU does give them the framework to do that. I think in any relationship there are differing sides and interpretations. Um, so it, how would you tell your Border Patrol if, for example, one of the land managers under DOI told them the MOU was no longer in, in effect because there was a new administration? Well, they, we, they, we have you know, regular people on the ground that are designed to programmatically work these issues and then operationally understand amongst themselves how we are going to interpret the, how, not how to interpret the MOU, but that the framework exists to solve any of the problems as they are raised. So what would you tell that land manager when he said that? I would refer him to the public lands liaison officer. I would, you know, I could call over to, to Kim's office and we could talk about what, you know, the perceptions or, or actual restrictions were or should or should not be. So if, especially in the GAO report, you showed multiple examples of where this MOU has broken down, Ms. Jensen, how will the MOU function if your employees don't believe they have to or are obligated to follow it? I mean, sir, Ms. Thorson. Um, as Mr. Attell said, our, our responsibility in my office, as well as our folks in the field, is to ensure the, the appropriate implementation of the MOU. And so we, um, and in fact, the MOU describes a mechanism that if things aren't working out at the local level, that that is to be moved up to the regional and then ultimately the headquarters level. So we have mechanisms in place to ensure that it is being implemented as outlined in the framework in the MOU. So it is our responsibility to follow up on those instances and ensure that is, in fact, happening. That doesn't work, and I appreciate it, but it doesn't work. It is not working. The reports are telling us, the anecdotal evidence and the, actually the cumulative evidence is saying that system flat out is not working. Mr. Jensen, the fires you refer to in your testimony, how many of those are intentionally set? Intentionally set? We don't track the numbers that actually we know of what they are intentionally set. We track uh, numbers of fires by human caused and through lightning. Why don't you track arson? Are the Forest Service employees discour discouraged from reporting arson? Not at all. Then why don't you track it? We, we can dig into the numbers and as we conduct investigations on specific fires to find the cause of those, those fires. And in that sense, we can, we can get to the answer to the bottom of what caused those fires. But you don't do that now. That becomes, that becomes amazing that it doesn't do it. You also said you were not aware of any kind of in problems with uh, the uh, with where your agency has been impeding the Border Patrol, check the GAO report. You will see the very months I quoted from them here. My time is over. Mr. Tierney, we'll, there will be another round here. So I guess I am trying to listen carefully here um, to this, and it seems to me that there are some allegations here, not so much that the MOU, Memorandum of Agreement or Understanding, doesn't allow for things to work properly, but there seem to be incidents reported where it may not have uh, been implemented or worked effectively. Is that what you witnesses are hearing as well? Or, or you correct me if I am not hearing properly. I think that is accurate. Ms. Thorsten? Yes, sir. That's Ms. Accurate. Jensen, is that what you are hearing? would agree. Okay. So are we getting ample training to our, uh, the people in the field in all three departments so that they would have an appreciation for the memorandum of understanding and uh, the, the chain of how they would cooperate and work with others? There is an ongoing systematic way for folks to be exposed to it. We have it programmatically set up at, at each of the locations. And, and so that is a constant kind of process because we do have turnover in the field, relationships change, and so there is there's a, there's a constant 
you know, uh, revolution of people who learn and then need to know and then move on. The next group gets the same kind of thing. So it's, a, it, it's a, like any other relationship. There are ebbs and flows in the level of contact and its effectiveness. Is there a high percentage of people that are between trainings or haven't been trained yet uh, as they take on responsibilities? I would have to get you um, specific numbers, but, but it is our intent at each of the levels to have folks who are subject matter experts in the MOU and then have the responsibility for the liaison and the operational contact. Okay. Uh, are any of you aware of any particular incidents or incidents where uh, the Border Patrol agents have been absolutely impeded from carrying out their responsibilities by uh, interference uh, through the enforcement of some of these environmental and other wilderness laws? I am not aware of anything specifically, but I will tell you that with 20,000 agents in the field, there, there, are, there are bound to be, within these relationships, differences of opinion and, and issues that get raised um, through the sector level commands, the station level certainly, um, and then up to the headquarters. We have we've had instances where we have talked about these things at every level, uh, looking to solve whatever the issue is. Okay. Ms. Thorsen? Um, yes, I would actually agree with um, Mr. Vitello's statement. There are instances where um, folks on the ground need to work through things. Um, but our continual um, ch talking to them, meeting with some of our collaborative organizations that we have, the Borderland Management Task Forces and so forth, um, are a constant effort to ensure that any issues that aren't getting resolved at the very local level are bumped up through that mechanism and, clear, and as I said earlier, all the way to headquarters. We are very involved in my office personally to ensure that any time we hear there is maybe some impediment or there is a difference of opinion on the ground that we figure that out and we make it happen so the Border Patrol can successfully carry out their mission. And do you have disciplinary proceedings for those uh, recalcitrant uh, individuals that may be giving instructions or misinterpretations of the MOU? The, the folks on the ground are Bureau employees, and those bureaus do have um, performance plans and, and disciplinary and sort of a whole performance program. Do they use them? Um, it is not my, I, I can't speak to that, actually, since I don't work in those bureaus. Um, well, I mean, that is part of the problem of bureaucracies, right? I mean, we are here talking about one problem and you are giving us an answer and you can't answer for the other part. But is, will it be reasonable to assume that those incidents that may be reported by the General Accountability Office or those incidents that uh, Mr. Bishop or others here may point out as anecdotes or uh, individual circumstances will be reviewed and action taken if it is warranted? Yes, I would agree with that. Mr. Vitello, you agree that your agency will do that as well? Yes, sir. Mr. Jensen? Absolutely. Uh, is, is any one of you of a mind that there is a mutually exclusive application of the environmental wilderness laws and our security? That they are not exclusive, I agree. You agree they are not exclusive, Ms. Thorsen? Yes, I agree. And Mr. Jensen? Absolutely not. We are actually seeing examples where we are actually seeing success, and I think uh, just this year, um, we, we embarked upon a joint operation uh, called Operation Trident that is occurring all throughout this year that is uh, proving and demonstrating how we can work together and, and achieve both those goals. Well, particularly with respect to fires, I would assume that it is in your interest in, in the uh, forestry to, to make sure that the border are protected and that people aren't coming in and, and being part of the human cause of fires, correct? That is absolutely correct. Okay. Uh, and, Ms. Vitello, let me just end with you. Is, uh, are you, as a representative of the, uh, the Border Patrol, here to lodge a complaint of any sort about the way that environmental laws or conservation laws or wilderness laws or anything else are impeding the ability of you and your men and women uh, to protect this country and, and protect our national security? No, no, no complaint. I, I, I agree that the framework allows us to solve this problem in a practical way. Um, as Ms. Thorson said, it is best to do that at the, at the field um, with the folks that are responsible for implementation directly. And you will do that? Yes. Thank you. Yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chaffetz. Uh, are you all familiar with the uh, Border Security GAO report February 15, 2011? This is the one, Preliminary Observations on Border Control Measures for the Southwest Border. We keep referring to the GAO report. Are you familiar with it? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Yes. All three of you, yes? Yes? Yes. Yes. yes? All right. Uh, Mr. Vitello, I, I hope I am pronouncing your name right. You write in your written testimony, quote, Border Patrol's enforcement efforts on Federal lands can pose unique challenges. What are the unique challenges? Well, I think the challenges are that they are, like a lot of the enforcement work that is done, both for the Border Patrol and in all law enforcement, there is a legal framework that we work, that we, which that is we operate different. In. That is different because it is on, on protected land. Yes, it is. And, and the access, your ability to patrol is different 
than it is on, say, private land or different types of public land that aren't designated as wilderness, correct? Right. So, that, so the, depending on the it environment, is different. it is different. Absolutely. Okay. Um, Seventeen of the 26 Border Patrol stations interviewed by the GAO indicated, quote, when they attempted to obtain a permit or permission to access portions of Federal lands, delays and restrictions have resulted from complying with land management laws, end quote. Would you agree with that or disagree with that? Well, That's it is in the report, so I have no dispute about the fact but that But you also testify that there is no problem. Everything is getting along rosy. And yet I go back and I read this GAO report, and you have only secured 129 miles of a 2,000-mile border. You can't come before the American people in this country and say that everything is rosy and fine. People are dying. They are getting killed because we have these big gaping holes in our security and they are going into some of the most inhospitable pieces of land and they are dying. They are being dehydrated, they are going through these cactus-ridden areas and they are dying. And we are putting border patrols out there and say, oh, just go on foot, just go on horse, because we would much rather protect this little cactus and this little roadrunner. That is what I have got a concern about. So for you to testify routinely that everything is fine, it is not different, I am not aware of any instance, and then read that we are having permit and permission troubles is troubling. Let me go on. According to the GAO, 14 of the 17 agents in charge, agents in charge, people that you should be personally familiar with, of the Border Patrol stations indicated delays by Federal land managers who reported that they have, quote, been unable to obtain a permit or permission to access certain areas in a timely manner because of how long it takes for land managers to comply with environmental laws. So <laughs> how have these delays, based on this report, lessened the agent's ability to detect undocumented aliens in some areas? That, that's the, the, the report is a snapshot in time. The framework that is within the MOU allows those agents in charge to make those requests, and when those requests are, are judged by the Public Lands Liaison or the Borderlands Task Force to be reasonable, then we sort through that and make it happen. Um, to, to suggest that um, it is perfect, that is not why I am here. Um, it the, is, the reason it is you're a here is because it is not perfect. Let me move on. As indicated by the GAO, in at least one instance, Border Patrol requested permission to move a mobile surveillance system to a certain area. However, by the time the permission was granted, four months after the initial request, illegal traffic had shifted to another area. As a result, Border Tr Patrol, quote, was unable to move the surveillance system to the locale it desired, and during the four-month delay, agents were limited in their ability to detect undocumented aliens within a seven-mile range that could have been covered by the system." End quote. True or false? Is that statement true or false? It is true. So how can you testify that everything is fine and that you are working in such with great relationship? You have a surveillance system that I would think that would make your Border Patrol agents and the United States of America safer. And these people over here are giving you a four-month delay. How, how come you are not here with the same type of outrage that I have? How come you are here just saying, oh, it's just, you know, we work together, everybody just get along? We got people dying. How do you respond to that? Because you have testified and we have listened to what you said that, oh, everything is fine. The, the framework allows for us to move through these issues and this problem. Is it perfect? No. It, yeah. But in this instance, if, if in a report wanna, that if, came out, it is four-month delay. How do you, Ms. Thorson, how do you, how do you respond to this? Mr. Jensen, jump in here. Four-month delay. Why does that happen? I'm, I'm tracking, I'm looking at, I'm asking my folks here to find uh, examples uh, on the National Forest System land here, and we're working as quickly as possible to work through the requests that come through. And we have examples in front of us now, um, the Zone 20 project, where we are actually moving to build roads within uh, on restricted lands, um, where we are seeing success. It does not happen immediately in every single case, but we are actually we are making tremendous progress in working together to address these concerns as they arise. My time has expired. Yield back. Sorry, Mr. Kilding. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, all of us feel on this issue certainly as strongly as Mr. Chaffetz, but I think, you know, some of us express ourselves differently. And I have been here 34 years, and I always find it a great opportunity when you have people from the field who know this issue very well to uh, keep the uh, 
level of trying to learn uh, at, at a high level. So I really appreciate uh, your uh, helping to enlighten us. We're not always going to agree, but I think that uh, we have this opportunity to learn from you. Uh, let me ask you uh, this question. I'll dr address it to uh, Ms. Thorson, but any of you may answer. Uh, if there's an incident or a pattern of ignoring the uh, MOU that we've been talking about, what is your, your reaction or response to that? And should there be something stronger than an MOU? Should there be something in law? Uh, thank you, Congressman. Um, our actions, if there was a consistent pattern um, of ignoring the MOU, as I stated earlier, we have a mechanism in place um, to bring that to our attention at headquarters. And, and in numerous instances, I personally get involved and other members of my staff um, talking to Mr. Vitello or Chief Fisher with the Border Patrol um, to come together to figure out what's going on. And then we also talk to our um, bureau representatives, um, bureau directors and or their regional directors who have direct control over those, location, those, those local units and come together to discuss what the issues are and to resolve those issues. So we do it very, we do it very high level um, for any incident on the border that gets to, to our attention that we know about. We will take action such as that to ensure that it gets resolved on the ground. We hope most of those are resolved locally, um, but they are not all. As, as we have heard earlier, they do get to our attention. Anyone else have any comment? Well, I, I would uh, encourage you to you know, keep it at a high, high level or even raise the level of importance, because when agreements are made, very often they aren't easy to arrive at, but they are done for a reason. So I would encourage you to uh, keep it at the high level. I think it is very important. I would not want to uh, stop a chase because uh, someone didn't want to follow a, a memorandum of understanding, which makes very good sense and is uh, important for very, very often our, our national security. So uh, I would keep it at the high level, if necessary, raise it to a higher level. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Kildee. Mr. Pierce. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ms. Thorson, are you familiar with the operating memorandum of understanding between the Las Cruces BOM and uh, the Border Patrol? Not particularly, sir. Well, in it, uh, the, it states very clearly that a mobile command, a mobile communication site there in the Big Hatchet Peak will be moved as soon as possible if the area is designated as wilderness. Uh, so it is there now, but if it is wilderness, it can't be there. Doesn't that sound like a little bit of an impediment? Uh, why wouldn't you, the people have decided to put it somewhere else uh, to start with if that were a better place? Doesn't that sound like a little bit of an impediment? In, in that instance, um, that is an example. Um, I, I understand that the, the repeater is on Big Hatchet Mountain. Um, and if, in fact, um, legislation were passed, we would need to work to ensure that it could stay there. Um, it is, it no, is I mean, it, an opportune it, location. It calls for it to be moved if it is designated wilderness. That says that conservation is trumping protection. Uh, Mr. Vitello, you declare that uh, wilderness and security are not mutually exclusive. And I know it is not exactly wilderness area, but the Oregon Pipe National Monument uh, that I visited in 2006 as chairman of the, of the Park Subcommittee, and they declared that it to be inhospitable for American travelers, and about half of it. Is it still that way? No, it, it, it's, we've, it's we've, wide open. It's completely open to American tourists with no warning. Well, I, I don't know the status of, of uh, the, the visitation for folks. Staff that, tells uh, me I, that it's still I, very alarming and that uh, the warnings are still given to American tourists. You shouldn't be in this area. Yeah. Uh, if the two are not mutually exclusive, why have you not? Why doesn't that area fit into your 129 miles of secure border? Well, the, the, the definition that gets us to the 129 miles is probably a lot longer conversation, but well, that tactical measure for agents in the field is designed So for, no, I want to know why Oregon Pipe has not been cleaned up. Why haven't you stopped the traffic that is polluting the, the area but also making it dangerous? We have made good progress at Oregon Pipe and throughout the sector to you'd send your, the state. Uh, you would send the Boy Scout troop down there from uh, that has got your kids in it uh, without uh, with just uh, without your presence, without, I don't think so, sir. I just, uh, I'm sorry, I was there. 
I saw the stuff. I don't believe he would. We have made excellent progress since 2006, Congressman. I, I hear that. Uh, I also know that uh, just last year or year before the, that the rancher was killed right down in that area, uh, and that was uh, in retribution for him turning in the drug smugglers. Uh, the uh, Mr. Jensen, uh, we visited in the Sequoia in that same 2006 uh, time period, and they actually showed us uh, places where booby traps, sawed off shotguns, they are growing massive areas of, of drugs in the, in the forest itself. Is that cleaned up? I would have to go back and look at that specific area to know the status there. I do not know. Do you that. have any other forest where that but you are familiar with the circumstance that I refer to? The circumstances. Do you have any other forests that are that, uh, have that many incursions of illegal activity in it so that people are warned, don't backpack in this area, you could get your head blown off with a sawed-off shotgun that trig has a trip wire on it? We don't quite talk about it that way, but we do, we do uh, make sure that isn't we, that, we do the make pictures, sure that were the Sorry. pictures that were given to me by the Forest Service incorrect? I would have to see those photos to know for yeah. sure. Yeah. So you, you wouldn't talk about it, but the pictures may have been correct. They were given to me in official capacity as in an official briefing. And so you would think it is incorrect that uh, you, you hit a tripwire and it blows your head off with a sawed-off shotgun that is protecting a, a marijuana field. No, How many what I was forests? going to say was that we want to make sure that visitors that come to the National Forest are aware of the, of the risks that are out there, as in any time you head into the backcountry. Um, I couldn't speak to the specific situation. Do you have any other forests where that sort of uh, danger exists? We are, we are dealing with some, some similar issues down in the Coronado National Forest, and we make sure that the visitors so, uh, to those areas are so, aware of So the Sequoia situation. is one of two in a very, very dangerous category, and you don't know if it's been cleared up. That uh, is alarming, my friend. I would like to follow up with you to understand a little more of the concerns you have. I mean, still, it is alarming that you are in the position you are in and don't know uh, if we have eliminated those, that's that's what concerns me about the testimony uh, testimony of all three of you here today. That you're saying that there's no problem with wilderness, there's no problem with environmental rules, and yet you can't explain some of the most dangerous areas that exist right in my back door. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. It's my intention to turn now to Mr. Lynch, and what we'll try and do is get through this round of questioning. We have still. Oh, a good five or six minutes, and a whole lot of people haven't yet voted. We'll then suspend for a few minutes, go vote, then come back here probably around a 10-minute break, if that's okay. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for trying to help the committee with its work. I, I do want to. I, I think that part of the frustration uh, exhibited by uh, Mr. Chaffetz was was well well founded. I think, and it's. It is really a result of the GAO report, and I think this was uh, this is a October 2010 GAO report on the southwest border. And, uh, and Gene Dodaro was acting then, and I have enormous respect for him. I have worked with him on a, on a lot of different uh, issues. But this report, uh, you know, invites Mr. Chaffetz's uh, frustration. Uh, it says uh, basically that everything is fine, at least that is that's what the political appointees and the higher level folks are saying. Everything's fine. We're working together. And but then when you you do talk to the agents in charge on the ground there, uh, they're saying 17 of the 26 stations, uh, you know, reported that uh, there were limitations put on their ability to patrol those areas. Uh, specifically, the patrol agents in charge for 14 of 17 stations reported that they've been unable to obtain a permit or permission to access certain areas in a timely manner because of the, how long it takes to work with land management folks. So, uh, and then earlier, Ms. Thorson, you, you conceded that uh, the folks on the ground, based on the Chairman's questioning, were applying a different standard for, for uh, border agents to get into certain areas. Uh, that, that's of great concern. And, it, and I think you're in, by this uh, uh, inconsistency, in what we want to happen down there and what is happening is, in, is going to invite legislation here, because the MOU is not, not being followed. And it is against the backdrop of a very serious situation. I have a report here that says that uh, we had 600 more civilian homicides in one border town uh, 
Ciudad Juarez uh, in 2010 than we had in all of Af Afghanistan. And Afghanistan's 30 million people. Ciudad Juarez is 1 million, 1.3 million. And we have 600 more homicides, and it's right on our border. I'll tell you, I'd be, I'd be, I'd be more uh, angry than, than Mr. Chaffetz uh, has, has been this morning if, if, I, if I thought that the safety of the people that I represented was, was being ignored. So you've got to get your act together here. Uh, we expect you to protect the border, and we don't think that that's happening. Now, you say that you can do this, that you can get together on this and make sure the environmental concerns are addressed and, and still conduct uh, robust security on the border. You need to do it. You need to do it. Uh, this is a, you know, this is this is a problem. I, you know, I think I've been to Iraq and Afghanistan about 22 times. I think I should be spending more time in Mexico from reading these reports. And uh, this is right on our border, and we can't afford to be slack anymore. So, uh, I'm hoping that uh, either you address it with a, a tighter description of of what is permissible for the border security folks, or uh, you just come to Congress and say, we can't resolve this, and why don't you do it on our behalf? But, you know, this can't continue. This cannot continue. Uh, you know, the folks that live in those border towns on the Mexican side deserve better, and so do the United States citizens in that area. And we've got to get serious about this. And so, you know, I think, Ms. Dorson, if, if you have folks on the ground, who are applying a different standard that restricts Border Patrol folks from going into some of these wilderness areas in a timely fashion to protect the American people, then you need to have some consequences here. And I didn't hear a real clear answer on that when the Chairman asked you whether you are disciplined, actually I think it was the Ranking Member asked you, are folks being disciplined when they stop Border Security folks from going in there and doing their job? And I didn't hear a yes. I heard, well, we have we have, uh, you know, guidelines that allow us to do that. But I didn't hear of anybody being fired for blocking access to certain areas uh, you know, on the part of the security folks. I, Mr. Vitello, I know you, you give a rather rosy picture, but it doesn't, the facts don't bear that out, sir. I'm, I'm sorry to say. So we, we gotta, we've got to be better at this. And, uh, you know, like I said before, I'll, I'll close my remarks, but you're inviting you know, Congress to, to go in there and, and, and decide what the rules are going to be. And uh, 435 people are going to make that decision in the House and 100 in the Senate. And it may not come out the way you think it will. It may not be a better uh, <clears throat> solution than an MOU, a cooperative MOU between, between the two agencies, is what I'm saying. So uh, I just ask you to, as, as Mr. Kildee has suggested, you've got to work together be better. and. Uh, and, and, and start living up to the terms of the MOU and making sure that our Customs and Border Patrol folks uh, have access to that area. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Lynch. Um, let me explain the process. We'll do, just for a point of information for Mr. Pierce's question, 68 percent of Oregon pipe is still off limit to Americans, and 95 percent of it is wilderness. We have a vote that's taking place right now, a second five-minute vote, and then a third vote that's 15 minutes, although I'm going to ask members to come back here to vote on that last one very quickly and then come back here. So I'm still estimating about a 10-minute break that we'll have to take right now to do voting. I apologize for this. This is an abnormal day under our new schedule. The morning should have been reserved for this. So I'm sorry about that. I hate to walk out on you. We're going to try and get this through as, as quickly as possible. But we'll have to take that break right now. So thank you, and just uh, we'll be back shortly. All right. 